Hey everybody, it's your girl Herbal Farm Sister. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. So this evening, we have a special guest. We're going to talk about how to pack a bug out bag. And um, he's going to explain exactly what that is and how you go about doing that. Um, but the reason for me having this show today, I wanted to talk about, you know, we have that, you know, those seasons coming up where we have tornadoes, hurricanes, forest fires. All types of things are going to have to call you to maybe leave your home. And so that's why you're going to have to have this bug out bag. So today we have Aaron Olinger. And he's uh, located in, um, is it Dayton or Trotwood, Ohio? Trotwood, Ohio. Okay. Um, so he's going to talk to us about what a bug, ba bug out bag is, how to go about packing one, the importance of one, some of the items that are, you know, essential to have. Um, he's going to actually show you how to pack one. Um, so if you want to go about and tell us a little bit about yourself, I know you were on here before, but we we'll probably have some new uh, viewers. Uh, so they probably don't really know you. So we want to tell us about ourselves a little bit. Okay. Um, my name is Aaron Olinger. I own a company called Aaron's Imports. Uh, I basically sell army surplus items, uh, survival gear, martial arts weapons, and knives, fantasy weapons, things of that nature. I've been uh, in business now for about 20 years, and I've been active in the survival community since, I say, 1982. And I started training first when I was four years old. My parents started training me on how to hunt, how to fish, how to try to clean the fish, how to uh, handle animals on the farm, things like that. And it just been a part of me ever since. And as I got grown, I just kind of pursued education, different things to uh, further my knowledge and be able to help teach others how to prepare for disasters, basically. Okay. So this evening, we're going to talk about bug out bags. So can you explain to the audience exactly what that is? Yes, a bug out bag is basically a disaster kit that you're setting up for either a cataclysmic event or some sort of a disaster that may occur in your area. Uh, the proper way to start to put one together is to do a proper threat assessment of what threats that you think you're gonna face. And then based upon that, you'd have a good idea of what you should put in the bag that will basically get you through that disaster or get you through at least the aftermath of it. Now, most bug out bags are designed behind a premise of 72 hours, which is three days. Your basic three day bag, and I'm giving an example of uh, Hurricane Harvey when it hit Texas. The bag after the disaster is designed to get you through three days of sheltering in place in your home until a help can rescue you, or in the event that you would have to walk for a day to three days to get to a collection point where they can pick you up then that bag would have everything in it that would be essential to get you there safely and be able to leave from there go to the uh crisis location that they would take you to the relocation center and sometimes even those centers don't have proper stuff when you get there so your bag would also have additional items in it to help make your re help you to readjust to the new environment that you're in and give you a certain amount of creature comforts to get you to do that situation until help can really bring some supplies to you. Now, most bags, like I said, are based upon three days, but I would advise you to base your bag on a five-day principle because in the last recent hurricanes and tornadoes that I've seen happen, even the ones here in Dayton, it was a good five or six days before FEMA or anybody showed up to give you any help. So basically, you were your own first responder in the event that something happened plus in the event that you're forced to leave your house because the danger coming is that great what it gives you the ability to do is get on the highway a lot quicker if your bag is already prepared you can grab your bag and leave your house at under 10 minutes get on the highway because by the time everyone else gets on the highway 
there's going to be nothing but traffic jams. And as each car runs out of gas on the highway, it becomes a roadblock for all the other vehicles that are behind it. So for you to be able to get that jump on the masses hitting the highway to get you down the road and away from a disaster rather than getting you bottlenecked like the last minute people would be, and then they're stuck out in the open when the disaster comes their way. So going with that, I'm going to show you uh, a bag that I have and start to explain to you some principles that I look for in the bag. Okay. I don't know if you can see this bag here. One of the things you want to look for in a bag is here. You want to check the straps, right? Where they connect with the bag. A lot of times the cheap bags, you'll grab them and you'll be jogging or running to get away from disaster and the straps will break. And that puts you in a bad position when you're trying to get away from something and the shoulder straps suddenly give way. So you want to tug on those straps. You want to look at how they're stitched. You want to make sure the shoulders themselves are padded because if it's a narrow strip, it's just going to dig into your, to your shoulders and it's going to hurt. Uh, some bags will have what they call a, uh, a frame that they're attached to. The frame bags are, are the best to get. And if they don't have an outside frame, if they have a built-in frame to them, that's very nice too. It carries the weight better on your back. This bag that I have is basically a rucksack type bag. And for me, it's going to bounce around a little bit, but seeing that I'll pack it a little bit different, it won't be, it won't work me to death, but seeing that I feel that I can get to wherever I'm going in three hours, then that, I mean, in, yeah, in three hours or less, I'm not worried about how, how it's built. Now, I do care about it having the molly hookups. Some people call them mole, some of them call them molly. You can attach carabiner rings or zip ties, whatever, to them and hang extra bags. Like I have a bag hanging right here that I have about three or four MREs in, and, and it's hanging off of one of the molly hookups. Okay. On the, side, on the side of the bag, I have a sheath hanging that I will have my machete in. On the other side, well, on the back, I have my entrenchment tool or my shovel sheath. And on the opposite side, I have my sheath for my bigger knife that I would have hanging here. Now, there's also, let me turn it to the bottom. As you can see, there's some straps down here. On, one on this end. Let's see if I can turn. One on this end. And there's one down on the other end. Here. can't reach it it's right here okay and what i would attach to the bottom of my bag will be my sleeping bag Let's see here okay. okay this is a north face sleeping bag it's a mummy style bag it will keep me warm up to 25 below zero and it's thick enough that it forms a barrier between me and the ground so i don't have to worry about becoming hypothermic in my sleep when you see homeless people on the streets and they're sleeping on cardboard, that's because they know if they sleep directly on the concrete or the pavement, the earth itself will almost suck the heat out of your body. It lowers your body heat. And when you go from 98.6 down to, say, about 95 you're, you're in your core temperature, your body starts to become hypothermic. And if it does become hypothermic, while you're asleep, you could end up dying in your sleep. Okay. And we're, you're only talking a three degree to about a 3.6 degree temperature difference. Now, if okay. you don't have a thick enough sleeping bag, then on the opposite side of my bag, I have this hanging. This okay. is just a, it's just a foam rubber bed roll. And it goes right, right on the side of the bag. And... Again, it forms a barrier between my body and the ground. They're not that comfortable to sleep on, but it, it'll keep your core temperature up so that you don't become hypothermic while you're trying to sleep. Okay. And then what you also want to look for uh, is many, many compartments. 
The more compartments, the better for me, because then I can keep my gear organized. Let's see here if I can lift this up. Just on the outer sleeve, you can see the different pockets that are here that you can mm -hmm. put stuff into to organize. And then you want to have a waterproof area inside the bag that you can put your dry clothing. So if it rains or something, uh, your clothing doesn't get wet. On okay. the side of the bag, I have a big empty pocket here with a zipper on it. I keep a tarp in here, and I'll show the tarp in a second. With the tarp and the uh, 550 cord, paracord, that's what I would build a shelter out of. If I wasn't going to a center somewhere that had a shelter, I could build my own to keep the rain or, or whatever and the elements off of me. Okay. And see, those are the main things that I want to say of, about the bag. And then how many liters, how big it is, determines how much weight you're going to be able to carry. Okay. So um, I don't know if you said, do you, where can you actually purchase one of those bags? Where do where you recommend people get uh, that from? Uh, Gander Mountain, Build and String. Uh, sometimes when I may have them in stock myself, or a person could contact me and I can uh, let them know what bags I have available, or if they want me to custom build them a bag, I'm able to do that as well. So I've done that in the past. Okay, before you uh, show the items that go in there, you want to talk a little bit about your, your business, uh, Aaron's Imports? Well, uh, again, <laughs> I've, I've been doing, well, I've been selling survival gear since 1985. And uh, I sell MREs, uh, radios, Man, I got so much stuff. Uh, medical gear, water filters, emergency blankets, 550 cord, candles. I mean, if you just about name it, I, I can get it in and I usually have for sale. I travel with the uh, CNE Gun and Knife Show. So wherever there's a CNE show at in Ohio, I'm, I'm normally there set up uh, vending products. Okay. When, when, you know, when there's one down your way in Sharonville Convention Center, and that's usually once a month. I'm always there at that event as well. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you what some of the things I have in it and explain why I have them in there. Okay. This okay. is the first item. It's a fixed blade, and uh, I mean, a fixed handle entrench entrenchment shovel. Mm -hmm. Most of the shovels are collapsible. I just like the uh, fixed, hand fixed handle one that doesn't collapse. Okay. You can... Dig a slit trench with it for your sanitation. Uh, for defensive purposes, you can dig foxholes with these things. If push comes to shove, it becomes a weapon in your hand. A uh, lot of uses for this. And even when you're building campfires, when you get through with the fire, you want to make sure it's totally out. So you can shovel dirt on top of the fire and bury the fire. You're able to bury your trash in the event that there's no receptacles that you can put the trash in and keep the area clean. But lots of uses for this is a, a definitely must have. You don't, don't want to not have this item. And they're, okay. and they're not too expensive. They're right around $20, $25 range. Okay. Then along with that comes the next item. I'm using a cold steel panga style machete as machete that I chose to use, but there's many different style blades. I just happen to like the cold steel name brand. They're pretty tough. They hold a razor's edge to them. So I, I put a lanyard on it and so that I can retain it in my grip and it won't, won't slide out of my hand. But okay. for cutting wood, building fires, building shelters, even self-defense, machete is also a must-have item. It also extends your reach if you have to reach out for a snake that's trying to attack you. It gives you a lot more reach to be able to take him out before he gets to you. But I definitely advise everyone to have some sort of a machete-style tool in their kit. Next item I have is a serpentine-style bowie with swept blade. It's almost a quarter-inch thick. Very heavy knife. 
I can use this to chop branches with, chop wood, uh, shelter belting. I could use it to even dig with if I had to dig something in to build snares or build traps with, but very handy to have. And I could even tie this on the end of a branch or use duct tape put it on the end of a branch you use it for an improvised spear or hunting pigs or even spear fishing with. So very nice blade to have. And with the heavy weight, it's built to take, to take the damage. Then it goes down to another tool. This is called a hobo knife. Okay. Has spoon, fork, things. And if push comes to shove, I don't know if you can see this or not, but move it around here. Mm -hmm. uh, pieces come off individually. The whole knife comes apart, and each one becomes a separate tool so that you can cut the meat or whatever with. But they're they're known as being hobo knives. You're looking at about twenty five dollar price tag on something like this. And if you don't have the silverware kits, and you're not using a mess kit. These hobo knives are very, very useful to have in your kit. And then the, I have one other knife that I carry. This is a Swiss Army knife. Probably has about 12 to 14 different blades, different functions. When you're out like that, you don't know what you're going to run into. You may need a small screwdriver or Phillips head or something. And a knife like that that's multi tool has a lot of valuable tools on it that you could end up using. And then the last, well, not the last tool, but this is a very nice tool to have by Smith & Weston. Comes with a little kit and it's a multi-tool blade. Um, okay. A pair and this, when you go on the side of it, it has all kinds of little gadgets and knife blades and saws and different things that you can utilize. This is also a must have item because again, you're not going to know what you're going to run into. If you have to make minor repairs on your equipment or your car or something like that, a device like that, it's, it's super valuable to have. Okay. Okay. Then that basically, Oh, one last tool. This kit. It's a game cleaning kit is in the event that you're having to make your way in the wild. Mm -hmm. you have, let's see, you have your, this has a separate pocket knife. You pull this out. Has your knife. And this is all by uh, Gerber. This is called a, uh, I call it a zipper, but it's a game uh, cutter that you put it in your hands like this. And as you cut the fur on say a deer or, or a rabbit or something, you can just literally go straight up its body and that blade cuts the skin to where you can start to clean it. Okay. Then if the game is very large, it has that button. It has a bone saw. Okay. So if you had to draw and quarter a deer out and you had to cut through the big leg joints or joints in their body to cut leg segments off and cut them down to sizes that could be carried, that would make it possible for you to be able to do that. Otherwise, you're going to have to use a machete or heavy blade to literally hack. And that kind of puts a bunch of splinters into your meat but that bone saw will get the job done. Okay. Um, while you're talking about game anyway, we had a question. Um, sure. Hold on. I'll put it up here. Frank Williams wants to know, he wants me to ask you, uh, do you know how to skin rabbits? It's been a long time since I've done it, but yeah. And do you know uh, how to raise them? <laughs> no, raise them, I have not done that yet. Uh, if I had to choose a renewable re uh, meat source, it would either be rabbits, chickens, or probably bluegill. But if I was out, it would probably be uh, rabbits or chickens because they breed like crazy and 
they don't consume as much food and they give off quite a bit of meat for what little feed that you have to give them. Uh, it, it's hard to decide because with the chickens, you get the added benefit of the eggs. With the rabbits, if you know how to tan skin to make leather, you can actually make clothing out of their skin. So depending upon if you're in a Mad Max situation or um, just avoiding a storm, that might make it make choice for you on which which way you should go. Okay. He also wanted to know, uh, does Aaron do any fishing or hunting expeditions? No, I don't. No, I don't. All, all my fishing is done with just some of my local friends. And we'll go out over the weekend and camp out, fish through the weekend or something like that. Sometimes we just fish and catch and release. And then other times we'll fish and bring stuff home to clean and, and eat ourselves. But never done any expedition. Okay. And he's also said hobo knife. I thought they were called a Swiss army knife. Uh, what about a hatchet? Does Aaron recommend a hatchet? Uh, yes. Friskers has a... Uh, has a hatchet I like, but I, I'm more kind of leaning toward the lines of self-defense when I have a hatchet. So I actually carry a uh, military tomahawk and I use it for cutting as well as self-defense. Okay. Is that the I last question? That's as all the questions. Yes. <laughs> but as, as he said, now with the, well, I'm going to hold the two knives up where you can see them. Now, this would be the Swiss Army knife, and it's got all the attachments to it. A hobo knife has just three blades on it. It has your knife, your fork, which is right. Let me see if I can get it out here. That would be the fork right here, and then it's got the pocket knife on it itself. Turn that out. And then it totally comes apart all three sections of that blade you pull it and it comes apart and then you could take all three sections off separately and have like three eating utensils in your hand okay and that that's the reason why it's called a hobo knife people a long time ago when they was under a different name brand they used to call them boy scout knives when the okay. boy scout scouts were around I think that's all the questions. We have a few hellos. Good evening, SC. Uh, Frank Williams said, let's get started. Um, Shanika Bedford said, good evening. Um, Preachable Asset said, what up? Uh, Shanika Bedford said, when I went down to Florida last weekend, what you taught me about mosquitoes came in handy. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Preachable Asset said, hey, Nadia, I heard you're going, you were going to be on the news. Yes, I'll be on the news tomorrow. Um, I'll share the link. I'll be on Spectrum uh, News Channel 1 talking about uh, urban farming and just farming in general uh, as it pertains to COVID-19. Um, it's just a little short segment, but uh, yeah, I'll be on the news. <laughs> and this is a other little tool that I have in my bag. And it has two little sharp points underneath the little red caps, and it's telescopic in nature. It really opens up about I say about two and a half foot long. Okay. You can put hot dogs on it, pieces of fish, pieces of meat, and stick it out over top of a stick, hang it over the campfire, and cook. You can put marshmallows on it or whatever. But okay. It's just the way that, and it's real convenient. It collapses down like a little fork. And and you're only talking probably about two dollars for one, so it's very economical. Okay. Multiple uses. Then another thing that I keep inside is a GI sewing kit. You usually get these for about seven or eight dollars. It's not a very big kit. It can even snap onto your belt. And it has little scissors in there, a few needles, some different colored little things of thread and stuff. But what makes it valuable is again not knowing where you're going to be at. If you were to tear your clothing, tear your tent, uh, if you got a tear or even the strap of your uh, backpack broke, it would give you the ability to be able to repair your gear that you wouldn't have if you didn't already have that in your kit. So most people forget about having to make repairs and they don't put those things in their kits, but it's definitely something I recommend that you have. 
Okay. And this cover thing would be duct tape or you can use Gorilla tape, whatever your preference is. Most people don't look at that, but you can bring two sticks together if you're making an A-frame, wrap it around the sticks in the event you don't have enough 40. In the event, let's say that I got a wound on my arm Mm -hmm. And one of these, which is a feminine napkin, undeodorized. I could take it out, put it over top of the wound, wrap that duct tape around, and you have a improvised compression bandage. What okay. that would I mean, duct tape has many uses. Even if you got a hole in your tent, you can put that duct tape on it, and it, it makes a real nice patch. Uh, if you had to put splints on somebody's leg and you didn't have straps to tie off, again, the duct tape. I mean, there's so many uses for it. And if something's multi-use like that, you definitely want to have this part of your kit. Right. I'll show you something else. Uh, there's three particular things that I also add to my kit. Hand sanitizer. Uh, cutters, deep woods, uh, spray for the bugs and the ticks, the mosquitoes. And then I have something called no rinse body wash. Because again, you don't know if where you're going, if the water is going to be on or condition of the water or whatever, or if you're out in the woods and you're getting kind of itchy, you can put that on your skin and you don't have to rinse it off. And it, it helps re-sanitize your skin. And then I also have a bar with regular ivory soap, standard soap, not, nothing fancy. And because I've got the soap inside of a Ziploc bag, I have two bandanas. Okay. You've got like 55 uses for these. I mean, in a dust storm or something that's blowing something in the air, you can tie them around your face to keep stuff out of your face. Uh, you can make a sling with them. You can use them to uh, make a tourniquet with. Um, if you can't find tender, you can use them for tender to get a fire started. You can cut them into strips, again, to tie splints on with. I mean, there's a lot of uses for these, even when you're purifying water. And I'll show you one of my filters that I have in my kit. This is called a life straw. It will purify about 276 gallons of water, which you're consuming a gallon of water a day. And that's a lot of water to consume. That gives you 276 days. But what the problem with these are, when you put, put them in your mouth and you go down into the water, if the water's real dirty after a storm, you see a lot of particulates floating in it. As you start to draw up, all those particulates are going up in your filter and they'll jam your filter. But if you could take a bandana and put it around the front of your filter and use that bandana as a pre-filter, that'll give you a chance to get the full life out of these filters. Otherwise, they'll jam up on you. And you might only get 50 gallons of water out of them before they clog up. Okay. So, you know, as long as you can get a little creative in the field and adapt to the situations, you can come up with ways to, as workarounds, to get around that situation, be able to keep the water clear. But I keep two bandanas because, again, you could be with someone, you're sitting there doing well, and your loved one or someone that you're friends with, they're not doing so well. So, got an extra one you might be able to help them out a little bit and another thing that i carry 255 gallon contractor trash bags they're pretty flat put trash in them in the event somebody was dead you can pull one up over their legs pull the other one down over the head use your duct tape to tape it and that keeps the insects and stuff off of them until maybe somebody could come along to care for take care of the bodies or whatever. Uh, you can use these to carry water in back to your camp. You can also, in the event, again, you got a friend because you've got, it's a, it's raining out, it's storming, you got your poncho, but your friend's sitting there getting soaked and it could become hypothermic in the rain. You've got a hole in the top of it and two arm holes, and these become improvised raincoats that help keep uh, water off of someone. Okay. So Frank, I'll, I'm sorry. 
Frank Williams had a question. question real quick. He wanted to know where you get the military hatchet from. Um, Bud K has one. It's an M48. And then there's another company that I think it's Self-Defense Supply out of Texas. They sell, uh, I can't think of the name of, of it. Uh, they they have, a, have a very nice military style uh, hatchet there. And then Cold Steel also has their ver version of the uh, military tomahawk is what they are. Okay. Uh, Valerie Piggott said, nice. She never knew the difference. I think that's when we were talking about the, uh, the Swiss Army knife versus the hobo knife. Okay. Then Frank Williams said, sewing kit looks good. What about a hard case for that? Do they sell a hard case for the sewing kit? Uh, no, the uh, military kit comes in a canvas case that's supposed to be waterproof, but if you're not sure if it's waterproof, you can buy a can of that waterproofing and, and spray the outside of it. And okay. I would also recommend that with your uh, bug out bags because a lot of them will stay at the waterproof. But once you start using them any length of time, it's like that stuff wears off. So you might want to have a can of it on hand to spray it outside of your bag with to make sure that it keeps it waterproof. Okay, and he had one more question about the life straw. He said, other than Amazon, where can you purchase those from? Uh, Major Surplus Supply, I believe, was the, was the name of the company. They're, they're out of California, and, okay. and they happen to sell there. And then Walmart also sells them in the uh, sporting goods part. But I don't know if they still have any left because Walmart got hit so hard when we went to this COVID-19 situation, that when I went over there just to see what they had left, uh, most, a lot of survival gear had been pretty well picked through. So has COVID-19 created like a, a problem of things not being available? Um, I mean, definitely. I mean, okay. most of my suppliers, a lot of stuff is made overseas, China, Japan, different places, uh, Philippines, and as soon as this happened, the shipping stopped coming in, and then all of a sudden there were shortages or shortage of supplies and products started appearing as we got deeper into it. And, and we're only talking just two or three weeks, and things just started totally disappearing. Even for me, if, if someone was to call me right now and say, I want to order a whole bunch of stuff, I'm very limited on what I can still find because most of my suppliers are, are out right now. Okay. You want me to keep going? Yep, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I didn't know if there's any more questions. Okay. Now, and then the, I have two last tools here that I carry. I carry a regular can opener, and this is often forgotten about. You, have, you might have canned goods in your supply kit, and there you are with no way of opening it. And as a backup, because I believe in two is one and one is none, I have the GI can openers, which takes much longer to open, but it's better than nothing. Right. And these, these don't have much weight. Then let's see. I'm going to get into basically light now. now. As far as light, I do have a tactical light. Sorry about that. <laughs> the size that works off of AAA batteries. Then I have a little camp light. And these run about twelve to thirteen dollars. You just lift the handle up, pull up. They throw off a lot of light. Will light up your whole living room or whatever. You don't want much light. You just open them just a little bit. They run off of about three AA batteries. Super lightweight and weight. And I definitely recommend these. I carry two light sticks. Those are the Calamine light sticks that you bend them to, you hear them crack, and you shake them up. I've got one 12-hour uh, light stick, and then the other one is eight hours. Okay. Then for both heat, cooking, and regular light, I have the NCO emergency nine-hour candles. They're probably only about four inches long, five inches tops, but each one of those candles will burn for exactly nine hours. By the time it burns all the way to the bottom, there's only enough left over wax to be about the size of a half dollar. They burn so clean. Uh, 
made out of beeswax and you don't you don't get the runoff that you do off those commercial candles and then they're not sooty and if you were trapped in your car in a snow snow drift your car wouldn't start to keep the heat on or you ran out of gas you can light a couple of these in the car and they get off enough heat that you're not going to be toasty warm but you're not going to be frostbit either so it'll keep keep you alive and keep you going so okay. you're looking at probably about six dollars on about three of those okay frank yeah. williams sorry frank williams wants to know are you familiar familiar with snow seal waterproofer it's a very good product he uses it on his boots best in the business okay i've seen the product but i've never used it so i have no personal experience with it but knowing that he's recommending it like that i i'm going to look into trying to get to some of it is there okay. a place that he recommends getting it from? Um, I will ask him. Is, Frank, is there a place you recommend him getting that snow seal from? Also, he had another question. He said, I'm taking notes. Who makes the concealed light and what's the cost? Concealed light? The okay. concealed yeah. light? Yeah. I, I, I didn't have one of those. <laughs> uh, this is like, you know, camp, camp light. Oh, the camp light. Okay. It's a aluminum outdoor. And if you can't find these at like a army surplus place, you can get them also at like tractor supply stores. Um, or, and and there'd be some farm places that would also have. So like rural King or somewhere like that. I don't, I don't know what stores he has in his area, but, and, and I think Walmart has something similar to this one. It's kind of a knockoff. But it still gives off quite a bit of light and very handy to have. Okay. Um, uh, Ethan Coffee wants to know what is to recommend as a way to have water with you in a bug out situation? What do I recommend as a way to have water with you? Oh, okay. Uh, asking to hold on that question for a second. I'm going to come to water uh, very short. Okay. Uh, I'll answer that then. All right. Uh, Ali said he never heard of that brand. I guess the Snow Seal. Uh, oh, Frank Williams said it can be purchased on Amazon. Okay. That's good to know. I appreciate that. Thanks, Frank. And uh, this is called a 4-in-1 radio. It's actually a flashlight. Well, to, to work it, it's self-winding. Okay. okay. One of the features is has a flashlight and then you can cut it down to a lower power beam by cranking the radio for about five to eight minutes it it would play actually you have a radio setting so after a storm if you were trying to get information from the radio you'd be able to do it with, with this unit here. I'd have to crank it up some. Also has a siren on it, as you saw. Then it has a uh, USB port on the side right here. And it comes with an extra wire that when you plug that wire into it and run that USB port to the charger of your phone, you can sit there and crank your phone for about eight minutes and it'll put about five to 10 minutes of time back on your phone as far as electricity. So it okay. gives you the ability to also charge up small electronics or, or your cell phone in the event you need to get communications out. Okay. Then again, to go with communications of trying to get information, I have a Uniden. Uh, let's see here. And it's a... Uh, 40, 40 channel uh, CB radio. So okay. if I need to get a message out to someone or the power grid's down and cell phone towers are down and I need to get a message to a family member, a friend or somebody, we all have these. We're all able to communicate with each other as a backup to the cell phone. Mm -hmm. so, and you're looking at about 68 to $78 for one of these units. Okay. And they run off about eight, uh, eight, eight AA batteries. 
or and then they come also with rechargeable batteries that you can buy for it if, if you had a generator something that you can recharge your batteries with okay but that's what i carry as far as for communication is the uh, radio and the uh the chart the four and one flashlight then as far as clothing goes i have this folded up in my kit all this is is a uh, one of those military bo boonie hats mm -hmm. that you know, with. That, that's all that is. It folds up into a nice, neat little triangle, and it just goes down in there. Because if it's raining, you want to keep rain off your head. Valuable to have. If it's snow outside, you want to keep snow off your head. Still valuable to have. And not knowing when you have to evacuate, I also have a ski mask that I keep in the car. It's one of the, one of the worst uh, earthquakes that ever happened in the United States actually occurred in the middle of December. And people were actually put out of their homes in the middle of winter. So you don't know when you're going to be forced out. And again, if it's snow outside or extreme light or something, I keep a set of uh, military sunglasses. Okay because you can get snow blindness in just a matter of a few hours. If there's extreme light bouncing up off it, it'll, it'll burn your retinas out. You can't afford to be blind out there. Another clothing item I carry, these are tactical gloves, half finger, and then I carry a set of lever gloves in my kit. Now, one of the worst things that you can let happen to you is let something happen to these can't afford no cuts, any cut. I don't care how small it is, it has to be treated. It has to be cared for because there's bacteria out there in the woods. There's different infections that can enter your body. And in the beginning, it won't seem like much. A couple weeks later, there you are on, uh, having uh, blood poisoning, or it could even be worse. It could be something that's totally infected your whole body, and now you're fighting for your life when all it was was a simple cut that you should have treated. So you have to get into your mind that all cuts, as a rule, will be treated. Then I also have one pair of the uh, Border Patrol military style pants. Okay. I also carry two bivy rolls. Now in a bivy roll, it's just a pair of socks, a t-shirt and a pair of underwear so each one of these represents a t-shirt pair of socks and a pair of underwear so i have two changes of undergarments there considering that you will have clothes on got an extra pair of pants got extra t-shirts with you that should give you a uh, <clears throat> couple changes of clothing and see is there any other clothing up here no, that's basically it. Now, another item that's often forgotten about right here, I keep it in a plastic bag, roll of TP, toilet paper. You, know, <laughs> you don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're going to be facing. It's best to have it, not need it, than to need it, not have it. And I got a super roll here, and I flattened it out. I didn't keep it around because it takes up a lot of space. You want to kind of squeeze them and flatten them down as much as you can. And put you on roll of that in because when you get out there and have to go, nature calls you, you got to go. So, right. you don't want to be using leaves or something that could give you an infection. So, have you some toilet paper as part of your kit. Then, I also have multifunction compass kit. And this one has a Fahrenheit thermometer in it, a hydrometer, mirror, uh, split level bubble thing to check the level of something. It's got a whistle, magnifying glass, ruler, LED light. It's you got to know where you're going. So if you don't have a compass, how do you know where you're going unless you're already familiar with the territory? But if you go into unexplored territory and you want to know what direction you're going with, you got to have some sort of a compass to be able to navigate. Then the last item that I have for light, and I, I forgot to mention this, have three magnesium flares. 
Now, these aren't the road players that you put in a road. If you ever saw someone go into a cave in their cave exploring, they pull this pin and this thing goes off. They hold up in there and it lights the whole cave up. That's what these are. They're real dense. They got a lot of weight to them. I mean, just these three probably probably weigh a pound a piece. So it's about three pounds of weight that I'm holding in my hand. And these will run you probably about seven or eight bucks a piece. Okay. And another use that you can use for these in the event that you're in the woods, you're trying to make a fire and the fire is wet. I mean, the wood is wet and you don't have the ability to, to light it with a regular match. These light everything. I can tell you that right now. They burn at about 3,000 degree temperature. And oh, wow. They light, they light wet wood up. Then, oh, this is the last item, too. I have an emergency blanket. I do recommend people have two of these. I gave a friend one of mine, so I've only got one in my kit right now. Even in the middle of wintertime, if it's extremely cold out, you can take that thing out and wrap it around your body tape it with the duct tape and then put your jacket or coat back on what that thing does is it reflects your body heat back towards you when you see people in accidents and you see a paramedic get out what looks like a metal blanket and spread it over top of them that's what that is it's an emergency blanket and uh it just basically reflects your own body heat back to you to, so that you can keep your body heat in and not lose your heat then i keep two lever lanyards. Okay. And again, you can put those on your tomahawks, your knives or machetes and wrap around your hands so your grip gets weak, the blade doesn't go flying and cut you, you can retain the grip. Even in a self-defense situation, somebody hits your hand, that lanyard would help you keep from losing the weapon to them. Also, the benefit of the lever lanyards is in your boots or your shoes. If your strings break, what are you going to use for shoe strength? Those lever lanyards make great emergency shoe strength. But if you don't have that, another thing that you should have, I carry 200 foot of paracord. This is okay. 550 50 cord. Well, the reason why they call it 550 is it, take, it can hold up to 550 pounds of weight. Okay. So, if you're trying to pull your bags up into the air to keep them away from bears or predatory people to hide your gear or if you're building snares, if you're building shelters, you got to tie poles together. You need, a, a, if you want to have straps to tie your tent down with, th this is multi-use. I mean, you can make slings out of them. You can uh, make litters out of them to carry people. There's just so many uses with this. You can use them for fishing, make, helping to make weapons with. You can use a string for an for improvised bow. Lots of uses. Must have item in your kit. Now, I'm going to water. I do carry four bottled waters in my kit. I also have military canteen. And with the canteen, I also have the metal cup that comes with it. On the back, it has a little handle. Now, you got this. You can boil water to be able to purify water to make water safe to drink. You can boil soup. You can cook in it. So if you get the canteen, that's great. But make sure you get get you a cup to go with it. And it all goes together down into the um, military style canvas holders. And they have the clips on the back where you can uh, clip them right onto your belt or clip them onto the uh, Molly gear that's set up on your, uh, on your bags. Okay. But the canteens hold about two quarts of water. And between the four bottle waters, and the canteen, the canteen's about 32 ounces. That gives me enough water. I'm very familiar with the, where water is in my areas. Mm -hmm. I know where the streams are, the rivers, the creeks, the ponds. So being able to find water is not an issue for me. And then when I run out, uh, say my bottle waters, they run empty. I don't, just, I don't throw these away. Because if I go up to a lake or stream somewhere, 
I can refill these with water and seeing that I carry also on me water purification tablets. I can drop my tablets down into my bottle waters, put the lids back on them, put them back in my kit and while I'm walking or hiking or whatever. <laughs> I'm letting the pill do what it's supposed to do to purify the water to make that water safe for me to drink. So I'm using the, I don't have to have this since I've got the life straw, but again, I believe two is one and one is none. So if, if the life straw failed to get something, this won't, this will definitely make up for it and make that water doubly safe for me to drink because you're going to, you can only go three days without water. And if you drink contaminated water, got about the same time limit before it takes you out or gives you really bad diarrhea to where you lose your strength you lose your energy and you may lose your life and just in case you get that you definitely want to have anti-diarrhea medicine okay when people are under extreme stress one of two things happens they either get runaway bowels or they get stopped up so you if you're at home, you want to have also a laxative to prevent that in the ones that get bound up. And in the ones that has the runaway problem, then you want to have something that will help stop them up, at least until you can get, get somewhere to get some help. Now. So, Ethan, so between, uh, hold on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ethan, go ahead, Ethan Coffee wants to know, do you sell the water tabs? Yes, I do. Uh, they come in two different sizes. I have this size. It's about 20 tablets. And this particular one sells for about $15. And then I have a smaller size that was made for the military. And it's right around 7 bucks. Okay. Okay. If they want to purchase those items from you, how would they go about doing that? Uh, they can get, get with me on Facebook Messenger. They can find me at Aaron Olinger on uh, Facebook. And at that point, once they uh, send, send me a uh, request, I can accept the request and then they can message me. And I'd either give, I would just give them my phone number and they can call me direct, tell me what their needs are. And then I can look into seeing if I can still get the products to be able to supply their needs. Okay. Do you have an email address? Uh, yes. It is Olinger, O-L-I-N-G-E-R, 125 at AOL.com. Okay. And here's another product that I use and also sell. I sell these for about $3. They're called compressed towels. When you take one out, it looks like a little Mentos tablet. Mm -hmm. Little round thing here. But you put six drops of water on this, and it opens up like a little hand towel that you can use to wipe your face. You can use it to wash your hands with. And you can also use it for fire tender in the event that uh, you can't find any dry tender to use. And in push comes to shove, if you've gotten injured, big cut on you or something, and you need to clean a wound, those are very valuable to be able to clean wounds with. Okay. So, and you're only talking $3. You get about 10 or 12 in a pack for about 3 bucks. But they take very little room, super lightweight and weight, definitely worth half. Then let's go into food. Okay. I do carry in my kit freeze dried foods. All you do is tear this kit open, pour in boiling hot water, let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes. Everything reconstitutes itself. Then you can open the pack back up because they have Ziploc tops on. And then you can open the pack back up and start dipping the food out and start to eat. So these are lightweight and weight. They last forever shelf life, life wise, and they don't add a lot of weight to your pack. And easy way to have a meal. Another easy thing to do if you come to shove is 
little packs of romaine noodles. They don't have a lot of, uh, I say, vitamins. <laughs> in yeah. But there's other things you can do to spice them up a little bit, and they're going to fill a belly when it's important to do that because if hungry children, hungry people, it's going to be an unhappy life for you. Because uh, when the morale is down, man, they, they can drive you crazy. And the hardest thing you're going to have to do in a survival situation is get along with each other. Because now you're confined to an area. You can't get away from one another. Now you got to really work hard at getting along with one another. Keep that morale up. Another thing that I carry, besides spam, sometimes I have the little Vienna treat hot dogs. And I also carry MREs. And I sell MREs as well. These are meals ready to eat. They're made for the military and for civilian use. And a disaster, when FEMA shows up, if they give you food to eat, they're going to basically give you a, an MRE and a bottle of water and send you on your way. Now, this particular one here has, this one is a lentil uh, stew with ham and beans. That's your main entree. Get a napkin. This is a pack of four oatmeal cookies that taste pretty good. You get one pack of beverage powder. This also, in a hot summer time, will help rebuild, replenish your electrolytes. This is a great flavor one, but they got different flavor ones that come in the packs. This one also has two crackers, two saltine crackers, but there's no salt on them. Because some people have salt sensitivities. This one has, this is the freeze, this is the dried uh, fruit. And this tastes like candy. It is really good. I've had this before. It also comes with a little pack of coffee. But I only recommend use a half a cup. Because otherwise, it's, it's pretty weak if you try to use the whole cup. You got salt and pepper packet, one pack of creamer. This is a little wet nap to clean up with afterwards. You get one pack of sugar. Now, if you're not a coffee drinker and you mix your beverage powder together and it doesn't taste that good, good you can pour this pack of sugar in that bottle of water with that beverage powder and that that sweeten it up more like kool-aid this one also comes with a pack of crushed red peppers you have a toothpick a real long handled spoon and a little chiclet candy thing for dessert okay the MREs the human body needs approximately a thousand calories a day for the organs to continue to function properly. The MREs are designed to give you between 1,100 to 1,300 calories. Now, if you ate two of them a day, that'll prevent you from also losing body weight. But you can easily get a, get away with just one of these a day if you push came to shove and you had to ration the food. Okay. But they have everything that you would need in them. And uh, before anybody says that I've had them, the old ones taste horrible, but the newer ones that they make today, you got a much better menu, and they actually taste pretty good. They're, they're not bad like they were years ago. Then, let's see, food. Now, right. in the event I had to procure food, I keep a little fishing kit. I bought a little plastic thing, and I filled it up with lures, Hooks, sinkers, swivels. I keep that in the kit. And I keep a uh, thing of fishing line. Because mm -hmm. I can cut a limb down, make me a little cane pole. You can okay. try to procure some food. And also, I recommend keeping some sort of a, what I call, flavor packet, little plot bag in your bag that you could have uh, ketchup, mustard, 
things, little packets that they give you, honey, when you go to the fast food stores, save those. Put them in a little Ziploc bag and throw them in because if you get an MRE that's pretty blank, that doesn't have a lot of spices on it, you could kind of dress them up a little bit, make them a lot more palatable. Plus, I also went to the dollar store and got me a little salt and pepper shake. Okay. Also for the purpose of spicing up my food. So, uh, uh, if, I'm sorry. And Zinga Dialia, uh, she said, thank you so much for bringing Aaron on the show um, to show us his bug out bag. He's a treasure. And then Michael Graham had a question about the MRE. Do you need a pot in a pan to cook with? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me get my bag here. I'm going to show you something. Okay. Uh, the answer could be yes, you could if you wanted to. Now, some of them come with what they call an MRE heater. Unzip this bag. Okay, this is what is called an MRE heater. Right here. Okay. Now, on the back, you can see if there's a little chemical packets right here. Okay. Now, they tell you to pour water in them up to this second line. You don't want to put no more water in than that. You cut the top open. You slide your entree packet down into it, and you just lean it up against the tree. And it takes about 10 minutes. This thing starts smoking. Oh, and wow. it literally cooks the MRE. So you don't have to light a fire to give your position away or anything. And then after it heats your food up, you take your main packet out. Now, some of them come with pop tarts in them as a dessert item. And it's also in foil. And you can stick that down in here after you heat your entree up. And that this thing still has enough heat in it to actually heat your part pop tart up like you're toasting it if you want to. But some of the MREs come with these heaters in them. Now, in the event that yours don't, you'll have to get you a stove. And this is the stove that I, kit that I chose to go with. It's by Eastbit, E-S-B-I-T. I'm going to take it out, take it apart, and show it to you. Okay. While you're doing that, Frank Williams said, uh, yes, I agree. Aaron is a really good guy, sharp individual. <laughs> Okay, now this is a two-part system. It has a little base with legs on it. And as you can see, it has a cut open slot right here. Inside, there's a little square in the bottom. And these fuel cubes come with them. I'll take one out so you can see what it looks like. They come in packs of three. And you just take one of the cubes out, sit it in that square, and you touch it with a match, it immediately lights up. These burn for 14 minutes, and they reach boiling point at about seven and a half minutes. So it gives you the ability to even be able to boil water to make water safe to drink. And when you set your base up, it has a cup with a handle, and the handle folds up around it when you're done. Set this on top, and then you set your lid on top of it, and man, you're cooking. So, <laughs> and you're talking about $25 for this setup, and then the fuel cubes run about $8 for 12 cubes, and this is a handy thing to have. And you don't have to pour the food directly into it. You can leave it in the foil bags and just put water in here and boil water to heat up the foil bags. And then you can go ahead and, and eat it without having to dirty up your your, your stove. Heat. But this is this is a nice neat little kit. And it's all self-contained. It all goes back inside each other and goes right down in your pack. But along with being able to cook, you have to be able to make fire. This is a quart size Ziploc bag. And again, seeing that I go with two is one and one is none. 
have the Bear Grylls magnesium fire starter rod with striker. And I've got extra cotton balls with it to use with for a fire tender. I have a pack of three lighters. Why should I be sparking something when I can just flick a bit? Right. I have a little prescription bottle that's filled with cotton balls that when I put uh, Vaseline on them or I take a, a chapstick and rub against them, these make excellent fire starters. I have a nine volt battery and some steel wool because if all else fails, steel wool and nine volt battery will make it enough heat to create a fire. And I have two packs of what is called Insta Fire. And again, I can pour this pack on top of wet wood and I can light it and it will burn by itself for 30 minutes, giving off heat that I could probably warm my hands by. And then last but not least, I have a box of little wood matches. So I've probably got four or five ways of making fire there. So if any one of them is failing for whatever reason, wind, rain, whatever, I still have the means to fall back on something else. So if one fails, I'm, I'm not in distress. I'm not in no hardship case. I just go back to basics and switch to a different technique and get my fire started. Because you're going to need that to be able to purify water, be able to have a hot meal, and at least be able to keep you and your people warm. So if you can't make fire and that's basic 101, then you're, you're going to be in pretty bad shape. I mean, anyone that watches Naked and Afraid, if those people can't make fire, they don't last but a couple of days, and it's about getting over it for them. But everything fits down into a little Ziploc quart size bag. And on the side pocket of my backpack, this fits right down in there. And on the right side pocket of the backpack, my fishing kit fits down in that pocket. And let's see, what else am I forgetting here? Oh, okay. Now let's get into uh, medical. Okay. Very minimal, minimal. You must have either some sort of triple antibiotic ointment or some neosporin to uh, try to clean your wounds with. You've got to have some antibacterial stuff. Again, must have. Military style turrets. Because if there's a tornado or a hurricane, there's flying glass, chances are somebody's going to catch a laceration. And it doesn't make sense for you to sit there and call for help. And over 800 other people then call for help. And you're wondering if they're going to show up in time. Chances are they won't. And it doesn't make sense to sit there and watch a loved one bleed out when you have the means to be able to save their life until you can get them to some help. Again, got extra cotton balls. Got gauze pads. This is multi-purpose use here. This is called a triangular bandage, military style. Again, you can make a sling with them, tie them around your face for dust. You can cut them to make them into splints, wrap hands, wrap wounds with them. Super multi-use item. It's called a triangular bandage. I've got an emergency compression bandage. This has this is treated with a hemostatic agent that kind of almost makes blood gel, but it helps to uh, stop you from bleeding. And of course, I have quick plot combat gauze. This again is a hemostatic agent. It also gels the blood, create, helps the blood to kind of clot so that you can stop them from bleeding quickly. Got a couple pair of rubber gloves, nitro gloves. I have a bottle with aspirin, Benadryl, uh, what do they call it, uh, Tylenol and Advil in it. I have some iodine swab sticks that I can treat wounds with. And this isn't the fiery iodine that'll make you scream. This, this is much more gentler. 
And of course, I have the basic band-aids of different types. And then I keep a couple of the, uh, like I said, female non-deodorized uh, feminine napkins. because These make great compression bandages. And I usually have it, but I must have took it out. I even keep tampons in here because in bullet holes. And I learned it from the Bosnian War. When they was running low on supplies, they would just plug a bullet hole with a tampon. It would do what it's supposed to do. It would soak up blood. And as it soaked up blood, it would expand, thereby helping you create a clot, thereby helping you control bleeding. And if you can control bleeding, you can save a person's life. And that, oh, and then I've got three things of chapstick. Multi-use, besides extreme heat in the summer and extreme cold in the winter, you don't want your lips to get super chapped. If they start splitting and cracking, they get infected. And now you got a whole nother problem with an infection. But at the same time, rubbing them on cotton balls and stuff, mm -hmm. it's a great fire tolerant. And it's just a multi-use item, even on a big scratch. I can take a rub that chapstick back and forth on that scratch and it makes a barrier on that scratch. So if I don't have no band-aids, I can get to a location now I can clean the wound and treat it. But if I don't want a bunch of bacteria getting into that into that big scratch, I just rub that chef stick on it and it coats it enough that it just creates a barrier to keep bacteria out. But again, a multi-use item. If it's multi-use, in the bag it goes. Okay. And I'm kind of thinking my leave. Oh. Did, did I explain my shelter as far as using 550 cord and the tarp? Did um. I explain? I don't think so. Okay. I'm using a uh, 12 foot by 10 foot tarp. Uh, I thought about going with a tent, but seeing that my bag already weighs about 65, 68 pounds, that tent was going to add substantial weight to the bag. And I didn't know if I'd be by myself or be with a group because somebody else could probably carry the tent. But again, to just have something to be sure. I went on and got me a tarp. It goes in the side pocket of my uh, uh, of my bag, and again, I can break out these rows of uh, 550 cord, and I can make lean tos, pull up tents. I can make many different design tents. I can even use this to try to make a, a teepee out of it if I got poles hanging up. And there's just so many different uses, and that that tarp will keep rain, snow, different different elements off of you and to save your life versus not having nothing at all. I'm trying to think, I feel like I'm leaving things out here. <laughs> oh, security wise. Again, utilizing fishing cord. I have this. I will explain what it is. If you have to lay down sleep at night, you don't want people sneaking up on you, they have these. And these are what they call perimeter trips. You hear that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I can string, string the door handles, the doors, the windows. If I'm outside, I can put them across trails and string my perimeter with those trips. And then I can lay down and sleep. If somebody tries to sneak up on me and they hit one of those, that makes enough noise that will alert me that, that I've got problems getting ready to happen. And it'll wake me up, and now I can address the issue. I don't care who you are, how manly you think you are, you have to sleep. And sooner or later, when you lay your head down, predatory people or animals might try to sneak up on you, and that will go a long ways to keep you alive. And then going back to what I was saying about uh, your bug out bag. I see that there's a lot of stores and places like Field and Stream and different ones sell bags already made. I do not like them at all. Uh, they're very cheaply made. I don't like the selection of the food. What what if you have salt sensitivities or sugar sensitivity? But that those bags don't take that in consideration. It's best for you to buy your own bag, start to build it from scratch, your proper threat assessment you design that bag to handle those threats. Like 
right now if I had to bug out and I'm going to an area and I'm dealing with a virulent strain of Ebola or chimera or some sort of smallpox, knowing that I would put my bio suit in my bag and I would include my uh, gas mask. So, I mean, just knowing what kind of threat you're facing, you can custom design that bag to uh, meet that threat. So, uh, proper threat assessment is crucial. Now, a lot of things I showed you are what I call basic bread and butter. Uh, for those that are on prescriptions, you definitely need to bring your prescriptions. If you are going to go to uh, an area where you're not sure when you're going to come back and you're not sure if there's going to be squatters in your property when you come back, well, you're going to want to add your driver's license, your birth certificate, but you got to be able to prove who you are. You will want to have the title to your car. You'll want to have the deed to your house because otherwise the squatters are going to say it's their property and how are you going to prove any different? Okay. So you're going to have a certain amount of vital information that you're going to include with that. And I probably should have said it in the beginning. There's many different types of bags. I mean, your Bob, up north we call them Bobs, which is bug out bags. Down south they call them uh, uh, get out of Dodge bags. Is what they're called down south. <laughs> and you have what is called a get home bag or everyday carry. That would be equal to what I have right here. Just a little short bag with a sling on it, you carry it in your car in the event of an EMP and your car stops or for whatever reason, you have to walk home from work. This I have about a day and a half worth of food and water in it. I have a first aid kit here on the side, flashlight here, knife here, and I've got other support gear inside. And like I said, just a little small bag, but it's what it's called an everyday carry or what they call a uh, get home bag of GHB. Then you have the biggest bag you can carry. It's called an inch bag. And inch stands for I'm never coming home. The threat is so bad, it's almost like Chernobyl. Once those people relocated, it was never coming back. So you had to have enough stuff in it to literally support you for a while. And you do want to have cash in your in your bag because if it's not doomsday type deal you may want to stay at a motel and usually motels during a disaster they price gouge so you have to have enough money on you to be able to afford the double and triple high rates that some of them charge but uh, definitely want to have some money in the bag and anything else that you think you would need I mean if the situation's bad and looting's going on you're going to want to carry some form of self-defense in your bag and probably carry extra ammunition up. It's not a gun that you're carrying. Uh, you're gonna have to pick and choose what morally you feel that you can handle, but you should have some form of self-defense on you because otherwise someone's gonna come up and take your bag from you because they're gonna figure you got something in that bag that can help you, it can help them. And there's gonna be those that's gonna try to test you. So you'll wanna have some ability to be able to hold on to that bag and not let people take it from you. Go, go ahead, Nadia. I see somebody's got a question. All right. So, uh, um, is it Nikaya Herring said, super informative discussion. Thank you both. I have a question. I have a small child, four years old. Should she have her own bag and carry her literal weight, 35 pounds or so? Most bags should only be a third of your body weight. So, if you're a 120 pound female, your bag to be comfortable should be no more than about 40 pounds. So I don't know how much she weighs, uh, should be limited, but yes, she should have a bag and it should even include some form of games or coloring books or something. Because again, when you get to where you're going, to keep that morale up is going to be important. And it should also have some treat food in it. I mean, I carry granola, a couple of granola bars with me, but even in a grid, a grid down situation, chocolate can have a dramatic effect on morale because hell exists outside and you're in you're sheltering in your house and you're using your supplies you should have supplies on hand and certain treat foods on hand that will make a person temporarily forget 
the hell exists outside. You want to keep that morale up because as long as a person morale is up, he's keen on survival. Anytime you watch Naked and Afraid, Alone, or any of those survival shows, when that person reaches a point, I don't care what their skill level is or what gear equipment they have, when they reach that emotional, mental level where they give up, it's over with. So keeping that and maintaining that morale is going to be one of the most important things that you're going to be able to do. So if you got some games, you got some treat foods, you got stuff, it goes a long way. Was there any other questions, Nadia? Not right, right, right now, no. But I'm trying to think. And, and going back to the bags, again, custom design them to fit you. Even if you have pets, they do make uh, packs that, have, that can mount on dogs. And a dog can carry his own food. He can carry some water. He can, might be able to carry your ammunition. I mean, utilize them in the survival plan. But the dogs themselves, whatever your pet you got, they should have a bag. And then you should look into medicines. Sometimes I post information on human medicines that animals can take. And it, and I, it includes information on what, what it treats in that animal. So if you ever see those posts on my Facebook page, save those pictures to your phone. And you'll find that information useful and what type of medicines possibly you should be stocking for both you and your animals. It can be used back and forth. I mean, I mean, even in a survival situation, if you have antibiotics, that's going to be extremely valuable to have. Because if, if uh, the hospital is overrun with injured people and you go there and wait for help, you can be there for two or three days uh, and never get to see nobody because everybody coming in, anyone that's worse shape than you are, is going to be moved ahead of you in line. They're going to do what they call triage. And the ones that don't need it as bad, it's sit there possibly to bleed out. So I, I would have certain things on hand to handle bleeding and be able to control bleeding. Okay. If you got things going for you, you can save that person's life. Okay. DK Homesteader said, uh, hold on. Oops. They said great information, and then Kimberly Landry said great information. I have never ever thought about my dog having a survival pack. I used to sell them. They they were about twenty eight dollars. <laughs> they mount on a dog between the weight of forty pounds to about I think it was one hundred twenty pounds, and it went around them like a vest, and it had two bags that hung on each side. I remember one couple I sold it to. They had two dogs. One was a husky. And I remember the man saying, if we put this on such and such, he's going to turn around and just rip the thing off. And <laughs> but they use the other dog would actually carry it. But that's something that you have to get the animal used to. You can make it make a little fun and game with it, put it on them, play hide and seek and have them try to find the family member in the house or whatever while he's carrying his pack and just get them used to carrying that weight. And that they can uh, render a lot of help to you. Should, should the uh, should we also be like just practicing carrying it around around the house and things? I I go so far as sometimes I'll take a walk in my neighborhood and I walk around the block or something. I'll throw my pack on. Now I take the blades off because I don't want someone <laughs> feeling, feeling that the terrorist attack is about to happen. So or I might go to a, a school track somewhere and walk me three or four laps around so I can get used to that weight. Because I'm telling you. It, it's a lot more weight that your knees are not going to be used to doing. So if you're not avidly and physically training to stay in shape, it, it's best to get used to that weight and how it's going to be bouncing and how it's going to be pulling you back and affecting your back. And for an elderly person that can't support that weight, what I would recommend is put your kit together using a bag that is on wheels. Uh, okay. You see them move them at airports. They pull them behind them. Uh, but that's going to limit you to mostly staying on pavement, but uh, if you can't secure your pack and most uh, older women will not be able to support that weight, it's best to put it on wheels so that you can pull it behind you. Okay, uh, BK Homesteader said, how about having first aid books and other manuals? Should we pack those? I have a library of that stuff, but this, this is something that you wanna train for in advance. I mean, I've taken, combat medicine, I've taken uh, handling 
uh, bullet wounds and knife wounds in the field. I've studied different things in, in that. I mean, with Nadia, I've studied, uh, what, what was that called? Uh, hydroponics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you want to get a certain amount of skills under your belt so that when something happens, you know what to do and how to handle it immediately. Because time's critical. You're not going to get a lot of time to read a book. And also in that situation, the person that's needing the help, if they see you reading a book and you're trying to help them, they're going to be a little bit afraid letting you do anything to them. So as a confidence builder, if it looks like you already know what to do ahead of time, that's going to go a long ways to having the people around you have to have faith in you. Because when, when all madness is breaking out and shit's hitting the fan and everybody's panicking, to have that one person that can sit there and say, don't worry about this. I've got it. I've got everything handled. There's nothing to worry about. I mean, to have that much preparation under your belt is going to go a long ways to build confidence in the group. Everybody else can be scared. Right. Uh, Ali said best for first aid and survival manuals are the Army Ranger survival manual or first aid. And then he also said exercise is important. And then Kimberly Landry said we have a pack made for everyone in the household in their room. We did that when we first moved in. That's good to have. And make sure that the people in the house knows how to use the products that are in it. Because again, you could have ton of stuff in your pack but if you've never used it before and when all that pressure gets put on you people can make mistakes and those mistakes in survival situations can be detrimental someone could end up injured or someone could end up cut and again to know how to use everything know even the safety issues of guns if you choose guns being able to hold a machete or something know that when you're chopping with it you start to get tired or your grip starts to get weak stop chopping for a minute you're not in a race. There's no deadline. Most people keep going, and next thing you know, they are miss chopping and, and hit their own leg, or they the thing will leave their hand and bounce back at them, and now they got an injury. You're not in a race. You're not going to get a bonus for getting done early. Just stop for a minute and rest until you can get your grip back, and then go back to doing the technique that you were doing. Right. Right. Let's see, any other questions here? Kimberly said, will do. Um, any other questions or concerns? Well, well I do want to mention, uh, I can't overemphasize security. I didn't cover a lot of security here because, again, that's going to be individual. Some people might use a bow or crossbow. Others might use guns. Some may use swords or machetes. I mean, Everyone's going to have to choose what, they, what they've what they got, but you should figure out some means. Because even during Hurricane Harvey, there was groups of people that came afterward, and they called them Jakes. And there would be between 6 to 12 of them. They'd come up. Two or three would have guns. The rest would have machetes or some sort of big knife in their hand. And they were going up to people's doors at their houses, banging on the doors. And they would tell them, you either bring us something out here, or we're going to burn your house down. And... The people were bringing out cases of water to them, bringing out canned goods or whatever, and was running short on their own supplies to keep these marauders from trying to burn them out. Right. So you're going to have to make a decision on what you're going to do. Even during Hurricane Sandy, people in New York are not allowed to own guns. So people were out there with bows, golf clubs. I mean, the neighbors came together in groups to defend themselves against gangs and motorcycle groups and different ones that were organized to start coming into their neighborhoods to move, take everything from them. They came together in an organized group to defend against that with whatever improvised weapons they could make. They baseball bats. I mean, I saw a variety of people with a variety of, of melee weapons. And that's what I'm going to call them as melee weapons. Right. But, <laughs> they, they had to do that because those who don't prepare, I call them zombies. When things get desperate, desperate people will do desperate acts. And the first thing they're going to try to do is think of who they know has got that kind of stuff or who might have it or what neighborhood might be a little bit better off. They're going to come and take the stuff from you. Right. So Ali said, for practice, when I buy items for the pack, I always buy more than two and have some practice. BK Homesteader said, if someone is just starting to prep, 
where would you advise them to focus on primarily? Okay, I have five categories that I recommend that you go with, and these are going to be in order of importance. The very first one is water. You know, and the rule of three, which basically says you can survive three minutes without air, you can survive three hours in severe weather without shelter or warmth, you can survive three days without water, three weeks without food. Now, you can go 21 days without food. That's the reason why I'm naked and afraid. They only let them go 21 days. But you can only go three days without water. So the first thing that you got to consider is storing water and also having the ability to purify it. So you do want to buy you either some water purification tablets, some water filters, some sort of system, or even a distilling system to where you can have water. The so water first, food is second, Medicines is third. Anything that gives relief, stockpile, including prescription meds if you can. And then the fourth thing is going to be fuel, whether it's kerosene, propane, gasoline. I don't know if you've got, you, you know, if you live in an area that has winter months like I do. Uh, some people in my area has kerosene heaters, which I have that. Other people have propane heaters. And then if you've got a generator or you have a car and you want to have some sort of mobility, under the shit hits the fan situation, when the power grid goes down, those gas stations cannot pump gas because those gas, those gas stations work off of electricity, those pumps do. So if you want to have mobility, you want to be able to store some gas back. So the fourth item is going to be fuel. What you're going to stock of that for heat and for mobility or for your generator so you can have power. And then lastly, is going to be security. What, what are you going to do? and how you're gonna be able to maintain your preps. Because believe me, when you get about four to six weeks in, it's gonna be apparent who has and who has. You'll be able to look at people and they look clean and look like they've had baths and everything. You look at other people and they look dirtier in hell. So you'll, <laughs> you'll know who got it and who doesn't. Now, if you practice gray man, gray man philosophy, then if everybody around you is dirty, then you're gonna to wanna to rub a little dirt on your face and. Uh, look a little, you don't want to look like you just ironed your, your clothes because you turned your generator on and ran your iron. You, you want to look a little scruffy too so that you can blend in and be less of a target. Mm -hmm. But if, if you can't do that, then you better have the ability to defend your preps. And I don't know if people know this or not, but after 9-11, the uh, government ran a study to find out what was the number one threat to the United States. And that was anything that would bring down the power grid for an extended period of time. Whether it was the CME, which is a coronal mass ejection from the sun, a big solar flare that could hit the earth, and short all the electrical stuff out, which in the 1800s, they had something called the Kerrigan effect. That happened at that time period. So if it happened once, it could happen again. And then they had uh, uh, EMP weapons, which is electromagnetic pulse. Our enemies, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Korea, they're building those weapons to try to take our grid down. And every day we've got people attacking our, our grid through cyber attacks. I mean, it's a matter of time before somebody gets through with something. And if that grid comes down and stays down for, say, a year or two years, the computer models show that everyone in the United States will be dead in six months to 18 months, at least 90% will be dead in that length of time. No more than six months to 18 months. That's not that long. But they said that 90% of the U.S. population is dead. So if that's the number one threat, you got to have a defense against it. You got to have a way to be able to have food. You got to have a way to have refrigeration. You got to extend the life of your food. You got to get through the winter months. You got to have antibiotics or something to fight the illnesses. Uh, if people aren't going to be able to get meds or whatever. People are going to die. Those bodies are going to be diseased. So... What, what are you going to do to deal with this? I mean, the insects that can carry disease, how are you going to handle that? I mean, there's a myriad of situations out there. And you got to constantly ask yourself, what if? You can never get into a state of mind that you're so confident. You think, oh, I'm ready for anything. Uh, let it happen. I hope it happens. You get to that level of thinking, you're already failed. Right. So you got to constantly ask yourself, what if? What will I do? How will I counter that? and then set you up, up in defense to be able to counter. Okay. Oh, Kimberly Landry said, thank you. 
and such great information. The Midnight Queen, hello, Midnight Queen, and Ali said, uh, yes, gray man. What's that? I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, gray, gray man, again, is you're trying to bend it, blend in with your population. I mean, you don't want to be bebopping down the street with your bug out bag on your back, <laughs> looking all tactical. Everybody else looks like raggedy man. Right. Okay. That makes you stand out and that makes you a target. But, you know, if everybody's looking a certain way and you can make yourself look that way, now you're blending in. Even in, even in the, uh, it's called hiding in plain sight. Even with a pandemic, say a virulent strain of, of uh, Ebola was going through the United States and people were dying everywhere. Well, if I go outside and I late at night and I go to somebody's house that's got quarantine tape going around because it it's got dead bodies in there, and I take that tape down and come back to my house and I put it around my house, and I kill a few dead birds or a few animals, throw them out in the front yard and throw a few on in the backyard. When the looters come to that neighborhood and they come to my house and they see the tape and they see the dead animals and then they look at the neighbor's house next door and this house looks fine, which house do you think they're going to pick to break into? You know, I'm inside there. I got plenty of stuff that could be useful to them, but right. they're not going to take that threat. And it's called hiding in plain sight. So, and that that's a gray man tactic. So, there, there's there's ways to work around certain threats to make yourself less likely to be a target. Okay, Ali said a country boy will survive. Hank Aaron, uh, and then DK Home Center said, "Thank you, great info." I'm, I'm glad to be able to help today. And, and thank you, Nadi, for having me on today. Oh, you're welcome. Um, here is, is his Facebook uh, link. It's facebook.com forward slash Aaron dot Olinger dot one. Um, it, it, it should be just Aaron Olinger. It shouldn't be a dot one. Oh, that's the one I copied. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Well, there, there are several Aaron Olingers. Maybe I was the first one on Facebook. Maybe that's how I got the dot one. Okay. Yeah, this is a. That's the one. Four hours ago, you made a breaking news post. So, that's the one I copied. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, let's see. Ethan said, "Excellent, great info. Thank you both for your efforts and for sharing. Looking forward to the next one." Thank you for uh, tuning in. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if um, you would like to um, purchase the, what was it, the water tabs, um, mm -hmm. he has those available at his business, Aaron's Imports. Like he said, you can contact him on his Facebook page or you can send him an email and um, he'll be able to uh get those to you so do you have anything else you wanted to say or well present? you know any products that i have in stock if someone wants something uh i can even send them pictures or tag their name with some of the uh, photos that i have available at the moment again there's a lot of shortages right now which makes it difficult for me to serve everybody's needs but you know if a person be patient i can get stuff in usually within four days be able to get something to them. And outside of that, like I said, it's best to uh, custom make you a, a pack. Don't go out and buy a ready-made one. They're only made to, to last three days. And I mean, even the tools you know, are so cheap. Uh, sometimes they, they will fail when you're trying to use them in a survival situation. So buy quality stuff. Don't, don't go by price. Uh, as far as buying something cheap to save money, your life is on the line when you have to reach for that kit and your loved one's life is on the line. So buy good quality stuff that's going to be very dependable. Don't don't try to save money when your life is going to be on the line or something. Okay. Um, let's see. BK Homesteader said, hope you continue as a series. Yeah, so we'll definitely have him back on. As you know, things are always happening um, out in the world. So all his information is very vital. Uh, Ali said, thanks, Aaron. 
and uh, he also said thanks, Dadia. Um, so thanks, any other tuning in? Yes, thank you for tuning in. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Yeah, I thank Aaron for coming on today and uh, educating us on how to set up a bug out bag. Um, he he was also on a few was about two months ago, and we were talking about uh what you need to do to prepare for COVID-19 or, you know, anything in the future that is on the same lines of this. I mean, this is still not even over. I just saw that uh, a county in California, they're going to shelter in place still for the next three months. So um, it, this COVID-19 thing is going to be an ongoing thing as more people become sick, um, you know, more people die, you know, other countries, they, they're having a relapse of a whole bunch of cases. So, this is going to be an ongoing thing. So now that, you know, things have opened up, take the opportunity now to go out. So just in case they try to lock us back down again, you're able to have that stuff stocked up. So we don't have what happened with the, you know, the toilet paper and the, all the other stuff, the hand sanitizer and the food. Um, that's another issue that's going to, you know, rear its ugly head. It's the whole food shortage thing. Um, so I, I'm, I'm doing things to address that as well. Um, you know, teaching people how to grow, but also being a, you know, a source of food and things. So I'm going to be forming a lot of stuff this year. Um, once the, once the weather starts to cooperate here in Ohio. Um, but yeah, food, water, shelter, all those are vital. And all those, as you can see over the last, what are we, five months into this, um, they have been those things that have, you know, people been lacking in, whether it be shelter, food, water. Uh, you know, supplies. So now that we have this window opportunity to go out, um, get what you need now, stockpile it, but also learn some skills so that you don't, you're not always dependent on, you know, a grocery store or dependent on, you know, the government to supply uh, food or whatever you're going to need. Um, just know that you can, you can do a lot of these things for yourself. Um, so that's why I have people come on like, Aaron to teach you about, you know, how to make bug out bags or what the best weapons to have or, you know, how to how to prepare your house for a potential biological attack and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Did you have anything else to say, Aaron? We have another. Yeah, I, I just want to say, too, that it isn't always the strongest survives and it ain't the smartest to survive. It's the person that can adapt to change the quickest. Those mm -hmm. are the people that survive. And try to be that person that can adapt because you've got training, you've got knowledge, you've got skills set aside and you've got food, water, equipment, everything put back. Be that person that can adapt. Don't worry about being the strongest and don't worry about being the smartest. Just be the one that can adapt. Quickest. Right. Um, and Shanika Bedford said, thank you for presenting this, Nadia and Aaron. And then BK Homesteader said, thank you, Aaron. And then Midnight Queen said, get heirloom seeds. Um, I did a whole presentation explaining different seeds and things like that. You don't always necessarily have to get heirloom. Um, those are great to have, but there's other things that you can get as well. Um, so it, that video is actually on my uh, YouTube if you like to watch that. Um, but anything else? <laughs> I, I will admit that I was just stuck on heirloom seeds until I watched Nadia's thing and then I realized that I could also utilize hybrid seeds yes. ones, and, and I was I was fine with that at that point that that opened up a new avenue for me yes like heirloom seeds are good to have if you're if you're you know trying to keep a certain genetics of plants but heirlooms I mean uh you know the hybrids there's nothing wrong with the hybrids you know hybrids occur even out in the wild um but it's just it's creating a better or a you know a stronger plant that may be able to survive in a, a, a certain condition some of them are you know the disease, resistant to diseases and things like that so yeah just watch the video because i explain heirlooms what a gmo is what a you know what a hybrid is um what what a cutting and a clone and all that is i'll explain all of that i talk about dna and genetics and all that too in there um so yeah just just check it out um, one more comment and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, Ethan Coffey said, Army says adapt and overcome. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So like I said, if you'd like to contact Aaron, you can do so. 
Um, you can visit his Facebook page or you can send him an, uh, an email. And I put the email in the uh, comment section. Um, and also you can send him a message on uh, Messenger, he said as well, if you're interested in purchasing things or you have any questions. Um, again, thank you for being on here, Aaron. Can um, I mention the last thing? Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. And again, dealing with the weight of the pack should be about a third of your body weight. The lighter the pack, the longer the distance you can go, the faster you can go to get there. So okay. keep that in mind, but also keep in mind your comfort. So you're going to have to mix that and put that on the weight scale to find the right balance of how much weight to how much comfort that you're looking to be able to achieve in a disaster situation. Okay. Uh, real quick, Ali said hybrid isn't a dirty word. It really isn't. Um, and like I explained what those are and how those are made and things like that. BK Homesteader said, we love info on solar. I can actually do a presentation on that because I've ran a lot, um, a whole hydroponic system on solar. So I could explain solar energy um, to you. Um, and Midnight Queen said, thank you both. And is there anything else? <laughs> All right. Well, I thank you guys for tuning in this evening. Um, like I said, if you'd like to contact Aaron, you can do so by following his, uh, I mean, uh, applying to his email. Um, or you can find him on Facebook if you're interested in purchasing any of his products. Uh, send him a message on Messenger. Um, but, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in this evening. Uh, this video will be up. It usually, for some reason, on YouTube, it's been taking about 12 hours before it actually posts a live video. Um, so if you have the link to the YouTube, you can watch it again. It just won't be up until 12 hours on my actual wall. Um, if you're on Facebook, it, it instantly posts the video so you can watch it right after it's over with if you want to watch it again. Um, but yes, uh, so the videos will be available. And if you have any questions, you know, you can always contact me via all my social media accounts, um, all under Urban Farm System. Um, and... Uh, BK Homesteader said, great. Yes, thank you both. And then Shanika Bedford, can you build a solar panel? Yes, you can build a solar panel, but it'd probably be best for you to purchase one that's already made. But we'll, I'll do a, a whole live about solar energy and building solar panels and things like that. All right, so you guys have a good evening. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you guys on Sunday. Um, I'm going to do an actual gardening, um, farming Q&A on Sunday. So I'll you guys tune in. I'm going to put that up probably either this evening or tomorrow. Um, just tune in for that. And then I'll have some other lives coming up real soon as well um, during the week, probably next week. All right. Well, thank you. Have a good evening. Appreciate you guys. Talk with you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.